doesn't exist. As the proverb says, tomorrow never comes. There is no such thing as tomorrow. There never will be. Because time is always now. Welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast, the podcast about the stuff we wonder about and other things. All right, today we are joined joined with Dr. James Justin Sledge. Uh, His work engages with religious studies, specifically in the Western esoteric tradition or hermetic tradition in religious and philosophical thought. His work is much needed as it explores philosophers and intellectuals that are often unfortunately overlooked or disregarded by the modern philosophical canon. Um, He has ongoing project called Esoterica, where he produces video content that dives deep into the realms of magic, mysticism, alchemy, hermetic philosophy, theosophy, and more. It's phenomenal, and I highly recommend everyone check it out and subscribe to that channel. Um, Additionally, he is a calligrapher home brewer, ham radio technician, go player, and just all around interesting human being. So Justin, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. It's great to uh, great to be able to talk about these topics, and I'm really excited that, that folks are interested in them. So thank you Absolutely. for having me. You mentioned in a recent video that you put out that you were reading Latin. That's awesome, and one of my lofty goals. <laughs> I do you, also, do you speak Hebrew and as well? Is that correct? Or what's your background with the languages? Yeah, so I, I, I have a couple of languages uh, that I have. Uh, but yeah, I, I read Latin pretty well. I read Hebrew. I read Aramaic. Uh, I speak a little modern Hebrew, but most of the Hebrew that I know is, is uh, biblical or Mishnaic. So it's the, the Hebrew of the, of the Bible or of the rabbinical literature, uh, which is funny sometimes. I, when I've traveled to Israel and I, um, I do speak a little modern Israeli Hebrew, but sometimes when I speak to people and I don't know quite what to say, I'll speak in biblical Hebrew. And it's the equivalent of someone trying to talk in Beowulf English. Um, and they, they sort of look at me confused and it's a bit funny. But yeah, I have, I have, I have uh, part of learning Western esotericism is just that you have to have a pretty wide range of languages. Um, I think, as I mentioned in the episode I did just recently on the, um, the book of the composition of alchemy, um, that book basically is very difficult to find in translation. And so I just had to read it in Latin. And so I was wor- mostly working, thank God, with a, a Google Books edition from 1577. And I just read the whole thing in Latin, which is um, somewhat of a pain, but it's also good practice. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is this is quite a treat for me because over the years I've always felt there's been like a huge gap missing in the academic realm when it comes to education around lost arts like alchemy or monumental cultural underpinnings such as the magical traditions and various ancient philosophies aside from the run of the mill like Platonic, Aristotelian, etc. And What's always kind of bummed me out is it's, it's kind of a known thing if an individual wants to work to improve themselves and or grow personally and become more aware of their blind spots and their weaknesses within their awareness and focus, um, but and, and just become more well-rounded. And I think as a society, collectively, this is true as well in terms of you know, modern society, understanding our roots and our foundations and history and the evolution and progression of thought and I think the work you're doing, it, it's great. Um, it's a great contribution because it covers areas often omitted and kind of gives us a broader perspective. And so, yeah, with, with that being said, um, I must first ask you, what was it that kind of initially sparked your interest and investigation into the realm of the esoteric or what motivated you to undertake this epic area of exploration? Yeah, this is an interesting question. I've thought about this a couple of times my, myself. Uh, and I agree with you that uh, Western esotericism, whether you are a practitioner of that tradition uh, or just a, a person interested in history, it's, it's really a pity this entire branch of, of, uh, of history is basically ignored. And it's a, it's a real shame in a lot of ways uh, because we, the kind of myths that we tell ourselves as a society ultimately shape the trajectory of how our society develops. And so insofar as we tell ourselves that our society is inherently rational or inherently uh, driven by logic or whatever, 
No, that's a myth. I mean, the, there's there's an enormous amount of of um, of of magic and all kinds of other sort of non-rational mystical ways of knowing that populate uh, Western thought, all the go, reaching all the way back to the very beginnings of that thought. And so it's a pity to me, as, as a person who teaches philosophy professionally, that this entire branch of, um, of knowledge basically goes un, uh, unstudied. It, it's, it's really a very subterranean form of knowledge. I think for me, what got me into it was maybe a couple of things. Uh, the first was, um, I think as a, as a kid, I just experienced the world as very weird. Um, the, the world struck me as anomalous. It struck me as unusual. And the kind of shows that I watched as a kid were shows like, I don't know, Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World and Unsolved Mysteries and um, uh, um, all these sort of shows that are all about sort of weird uh, anomalous things, Atlantis and ghosts and UFOs and things. Um, and I just found this stuff to be really fascinating, uh, just intellectually, like, you know, are there really ghosts? How will we go about uh, proving that they were ghosts? Things like that. Um, and then later on in my, uh, and as I got older, I started studying alchemy. I was very interested in the history of alchemy. And then I discovered on the, as a teenager, this, uh, this guy, Dr. John Dee. And uh, John Dee is quite famous for his uh, conversations through the, his scryer, Edward Kelly, for having allegedly contacted these angelic beings. Um, now, people contacting all kinds of beings, whether they're ghosts or angels or whatever, through various kinds of techniques is nothing new. What was interesting to me about Dee was that these angels allegedly revealed a language to him, right? The language of the angels, this Enochian language. Um, and what struck me as very weird or interesting was that this language had structure, right? That it had morphology, it had syntax, it had grammar, it had vocabulary, it wasn't random. And that was very unusual to me. I was like, for me as a teenager learning, I was actually learning Latin at the time. I, I, having worked through Latin, you realize how hard it is to memorize all of the different cases and, uh, and the, the clensions and the verb forms. And I thought, this might be a place where something very unusual is going on. And that sparked an interest in, 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 in Western esotericism. And from there, I, I kept studying uh, uh, various kinds of uh, philosophers from the Western esoteric tradition. Um, and eventually it led me to uh, getting a, uh, a degree in uh, philosophy and religion and eventually going to Amsterdam, which was one of the few places and still is one of the few places in uh, the world where one can academically study esotericism. And so I did that. I, I basically packed up. I quit my uh, private job. I was working in consulting and I decided, oh, look, I'm gonna become a, an academic. I'm gonna go to Amsterdam and live in Amsterdam. Uh, and there I, I worked on uh, ac the academic study of Western esotericism. Um, and it's been a continual interest in my life. And part of the reason why I started Esoterica was uh, basically to correct a kind of weird problem online where I think that there's a great deal of interest in es esotericism, but there's not much of an academic approach to it. That is to say, an approach that's backed up by serious translation, academic research, uh, very grounded in historical analysis. So it's not just me saying whatever I believe about Kabbalah or alchemy. It's saying, look, let's actually go to these texts. Let's read them in the original language. Let's be very careful about what we say and what we don't say. And so Esoterica is, is basically at some level a project that is trying to put out information that is rooted and grounded in the most solid kind of academic research, but on the subjects that very little light gets turned to, I think, unfortunately. Definitely. Now, how would you define what, what is something that is esoteric? Yeah, so esoteric, the word esoteric actually has its origins in 18th century French. Um, we actually see the word esoteric appear there, esoteric appear there in French. And it basically just means hidden. And so one can think about, um, one can think about the history of philosophy or the history of religion in which many philosophers in many religions, for instance, uh, Judaism being an example that uh, I'm familiar with being Jewish, is that there's a public face of the religion, there's a public face of the philosophy, but there's also a private aspect of the philosophy and a private aspect of that religion that simply doesn't get taught to everybody. 
It doesn't get taught to everybody because it's very complicated. It doesn't get taught to everyone because it may confuse them. It doesn't get taught to everyone because uh, it may have implications that are, are, are dangerous or even subversive. And so the esoteric side of things is simply the hidden uh, side of philosophy, of uh, religion and other kinds of things. Um, and I think even in politics, right? There's the public thing that Congress does and then there's all the backdoor uh, you know, negotiations that occur in, I don't know, hotel bars or something. Like one might even call that esoteric politics. And so, um, and of course, if you think that esoteric politics aren't happening, I think that you're probably delusional. Um, I think more deals get made uh, at, at behind closed doors than they do bef uh, in open doors. And so part of what esotericism is, and this is part of what makes it difficult to study, is that it's the hidden side of these, uh, these various things. And of course, that goes all the way back to Plato. Uh, Plato even tells us in some of his dialogues that uh, that he is that the dialogues that we have are the public teachings. But he even says in letters that we have that survive that there are private teachings of Platonism. Uh, he's hiding things from us, uh, and this goes. This is a very long history in Western thought and Eastern thought uh, to a significant degree as well. So the esoteric is simply the hidden. It's what people choose to hide. Uh, and part of the job, of, at least my job and people who study Western esotericism is to mine out those hidden things, whether it be magic, whether it be the sides of alchemy. Um, and again, what's funny about esotericism is that what's esoteric now may have not been in the past and what was in the past may not be now. And astrology is the great example. We would consider astrology to be something that is somewhat esoteric now, but astrology was of course taught in universities in the Middle Ages. And so what, what is esoteric actually shifts from time to time uh, in historical context to historical context. Right. And I, you mentioned Judaism. I think that's a perfect example. For example, like surface level thinking, um, it's like Judaism, okay, Old Testament, the Tanakh. Yeah, yeah, I got it. But no, no, no. The Jewish traditions, they run very deep. And there's a lot of interesting sacred texts within the rabbinic literature and all the traditions passed down over time that helped kind of inform the evolution and preservation of the culture and religion. Um, we just can't ignore the history of Jewish mysticism or the rise of the Zohar and the emergence of the Kabbalah. Um, you know, that has prevailed to this day. I mean, it's like the fruit of the Jewish philosophy and religion, at least in my opinion. Would you agree with that? I think one could argue, and I think that I think it would be a very good argument that in some sense, uh, Kabbalah has become the official theology of Judaism. Uh, as much as there's an official theology of anything, of course, there's no Jewish Pope, there's no Jewish authority telling people what to believe, but Kabbalah is incredibly popular. Um, and so it's definitely the case that Kabbalah in, in many ways remains pretty esoteric. I mean, it's amazing how many texts, for instance, aren't translated out of Hebrew. Uh, the, it's amazing how many texts remain. Uh, in fact, I was looking at just at today uh, at the collected works of uh, Abraham Abalafia, one of the more famous uh, Kabbalists of the, of the medieval period. His works remain untranslated. They're still only to be had in Hebrew. Uh, and they're very, a very difficult form of Hebrew uh, in that case. So yeah, I mean, in, in the case of Kabbalah, it's absolutely influenced Judaism in an enormous way. Uh, so much so that uh, for most Jewish people, and even for non-Jewish people who hang out with Jews, uh, the most common service that people attend is Kabbalat Shabbat. This is the Friday uh, evening service uh, that most folks attend, even very liberal uh, uh, Jews in the, in the Jewish tradition. And that service, Kabbalat Shabbat, was invented by Kabbalists in the 16th century. And so in this way, uh, the esoteric dimension of Judaism, the hidden dimension of Judaism, has had a huge impact on the exoteric dimension, the open side of Judaism. So it's funny where this is a case where what's hidden actually has had an impact on what's open uh, in, in a very enormous way. And of course, Judaism uh, is very open about Kabbalah. It's not like Kabbalah is, um, is, is uh, I don't know what the right word, it's not like it's it's like it's like it's secret, right? Everyone knows what Kabbalah is. You can buy books about it in anywhere. You can get books at you know whatever. You can walk into your local Barnes and Noble and get books on on Kabbalah. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the more that one studies Kabbalah, the one the more that one realizes this is a very very difficult stuff to get access to. And of course, without having access to the original languages, uh, one hits a ceiling pretty fast, actually. Definitely. Now, what is the Zohar? 
and how does that kind of contribute and feed into Kabbalah and what's the significance of all of that? Right. So one might say that the Zohar basically is the backbone of the Kabbalah. So just to note, Kabbalah is one form of Jewish mysticism. There have been uh, many different forms of Jewish mysticism in the past. Um, in fact, for hundreds of years prior to the writing of the Zohar, there was a completely several different branches of Jewish mysticism that existed. And in fact, there are several branches that existed after the Zohar as well. So the Zohar basically is a mystical commentary on the Hebrew Bible. Uh, written, uh, most academic scholars think that it was written sometime in the latter half of the 13th century uh, by a, uh, a rabbi named Moshe de Leon in the circle that surrounded him. Uh, typically, people used to think that it was only him that wrote it, but now we believe that it was probably a, a I don't know, you've ever worked on a Google Doc, right? We have lots of people working on the same Google Doc. It's the Zohar, is something like that. At any rate, the Zohar is a, in fact, you can see it in the background here. Uh, it's just right back there. I have it behind me. Um, so it's a, um, it's a substantial, pretty substantial commentary, mystical commentary on the Hebrew Bible. Um, it is written in a very strange dialect of Aramaic. Uh, in fact, the dialect of Aramaic that it's written in is so idiosyncratic that you basically have to learn to read that dialect, the Zohar's dialect of Aramaic to really grasp the text. It's very unusual. And of course, the most famous thing about the Zohar is that it develops the system of the Sephirot, which are, uh, depending on how you understand them, something like divine emanations. And these divine emanations in the Zohar um, uh, relate to one another in all kinds of ways. And in this form of mysticism that we now know as the Kabbalah, the task of the Kabbalist is to uh, manipulate, in some sense, those sephirot, right, these uh, divine emanations, and manipulate them through um, Jewish practice, through various kinds of uh, observance of Jewish law. And basically, the idea is that observation of Jewish law um, not only makes you a good person, perhaps, or religiously devout, but also uh, repairs a, a sort of broken facet of the relationship between the human and the divine. And so it's there in the Zohar that we get this idea of the ten sephirot, uh, the idea of the divine feminine, the Shekhinah, um, that also appears for the first time, and the Sefer Zohar. Um, and the literature that, the practice in the literature in response to the Zohar, which there was an enormous uh, response to the Zohar after it was written, uh, that inheritance, that tradition, that, uh, that response to the Zohar is basically what we would call Kabbalah now. What's interesting about the Zohar, uh, of course, is that it's basically Jewish scripture now. Uh, uh, that is to say, unlike, for instance, in Christianity, where scriptures are the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Jewish canon continues to grow. That is to say, uh, what counts as authoritative in Judaism is a somewhat expanding tree, and the Zohar was basically added to that tree in the 13th century, and is basically now considered authoritative, so authoritative that Jewish law is actually affected um, by the Sefer Zohar. And now, is it is it generally believed that prior to the written Zohar, this information was transmitted just orally? Is that kind of the general understanding, or what are your thoughts on there's, that? There's a debate. There's a debate about this. Uh, in the more orthodox world, uh, the more orthodox world would say, that the information contained in the Zohar was maintained orally and it was hidden. Um, that it was hidden for basically a thousand years, that the authority, that the authority of the Zohar was uh, written by a rabbi in the second century named Shimon Bar Yochai. And Shimon Bar Yochai is alleged to have uh, composed the Zohar and that information was maintained uh, orally all the way until it was written down basically in the 13th century there in Spain. Uh, that's the traditional story. The, the academic story, the story that, uh, that scholars have reconstructed is that the Kabbalah emerges out of a, uh, a matrix of various uh, uh, what we might call theosophists, that is to say people who are speculating about the nature of God and uh, these theosophists, there are several different schools of them operating in Spain and France in the, the, the 13th century and the, and the 12th century. And we can see a sort of slow development in the ideas of these various theosophists that existed in Castile and in Provence and other kinds of places. 
And we think that basically what ends up happening is that, uh, that these various lines of speculation culminate in the Zohar as we have it. And so the more orthodox story is that this is all preserved orally for a thousand years or so. And the more academic story is that it's actually the result of a, of a, uh, of, a, of several schools of thought sort of coming together in the middle of the 13th century and producing the Zohar. Uh, I tend to believe the second half of that story. I tend to believe that, that uh, it's, a, it's the product of the 13th century as opposed to a product of the second century. Uh, but again, this is a, um, on the, and there's, a, there's technical reasons for that. If we can get into that if you like, um, of linguistic reasons, other reasons uh, why we think that's true. But of course, in the Orthodox Jewish world, uh, they hold the Zohar on the authority that was written by by Shimon Bar Yochai, the sage of the early early of the early Common Era. Okay, and then so how many Sephirot are there, and how would you define what a Sephirot is? Yeah, so the word Sefer, the word Sephirot is an unusual word. It's a neologism. It was a word that was invented basically. Uh, the first time that it appears is in a very short, mysterious document called the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation. This book is uh, very, very short, although it is uh, enormously influential. In fact, uh, this is, uh, if you've ever heard the theory of the golem, the idea that one can make a human being out of clay, uh, it's in fact from commentaries on the Sefer Yetzirah where you get the idea that one can in fact make this kind of uh, golem creature. Those commentaries were primarily being written in the, the German milieu there um, in, the, in the 12th century. So this word sephirot appears. It's a weird word because it comes from the same root or shoresh as the word for number. Um, so uh, the word in Hebrew there, uh, S-P-R, um, means something like to count. It means to count. In fact, the word uh, for numbers, right, in Hebrew is misparim, right? And what's weird is they take the word and they make the word sephirot. And um, this word is unusual because it's not quite clear what this word even means. Um, but it, by the time we get to the Sefer Zohar, what the sephirot become are something like moments within the Godhead or emanations or stations within the process by which the Godhead becomes God. Um, uh, Unlike in, for instance, Christianity or perhaps Islam, where God is thought of as a static, unchanging, eternal being, in Judaism, typically the idea that God is somehow uh, dynamic, that is to say God is actually changing, that God has an inner kind of dynamism to God. Um, and that dynamism in the case of the Sephirot is this interrelationship between the various aspects of God. So on the one hand, we have God's mercy, and on the other hand, we have God's wrath. Uh, on the one hand, we have, um, we have God's uh, victory. On the other hand, we have uh, other aspects of God interrelating each other. And the sephirot are kind of moments within the divine um, development that create, uh, that are in fact the divine being. Now, there's debate in Kabbalah about exactly what the sephirot are. Some of them view the sephirot as, uh, as actually the, the emanations of God, God's self. And some versions see uh, the sephirot as a kind of bridge between the infinite unknowability of God and our world. So the sephirot are kind of in between. They're kind of somewhere transcendent to us, but not quite, uh, not quite completely uh, concealed. There's debate about this among Kabbalists. Um, and in fact, this is, for instance, where in uh, Jewish mysticism evil comes from. Uh, evil actually comes from God. The idea is that, uh, that there is an overflow of judgment. There's sort of judgment unchecked by mercy, and that judgment unchecked by mercy, which I think we've all experienced, right, when you get really angry at someone, and you're, you're, you're rightfully angry, right, but you're too angry. You, your judgment goes beyond your mercy, and that, uh, in fact, the Zohar describes that as like, a, uh, have you ever seen a blacksmith pounding on a piece of iron, right, the sparks coming off the iron, that, that is evil in the eyes of the Zohar. That's, 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 justice, that's justice unchecked by mercy flowing out into the world. And for the Zohar, that's the actual origin of evil. So you have the system of the Sephirot is this very dynamic view of the internal relationships of the divine that is basically responsible in some sense for, uh, for our world, for the divine world, for angels, for demons, for all of it. And so the system of the Sephirot 
is in some sense a, um, a cartography of the divine. Um, and in that way, now again, it's a cartography that's dynamic, right? Don't think of it as static. Think of these various kinds of things as operating and moving with each other and in, in a relationship. Uh, and so um, the, the Sephirot are incredibly complex. And uh, when many people encounter, the, encounter this idea for the first time, it's incredibly puzzling. And I'll say that uh, as a person who studied Western esotericism for my professional career, that the Zohar as a text remains the most intimidating book uh, that I've ever encountered in Western esotericism. I would happily read um, alchemical literature in Latin all day long. And uh, when I crack open the Zohar in its strange Aramaic, uh, it's just like hitting a brick wall. Uh, so it is very intimidating and very difficult, although it is available in a, a really wonderful translation by Daniel Matt uh, in English, which is very reliable and highly recommended, but uh, a, a mysterious text nonetheless and a very difficult text and one that one could basically study one's whole life and uh, I think still not exhaust its, uh, its mysteries. Yeah, it's definitely fascinating. And there's just tons of, they can go off into so many directions. Actually, do you have any thoughts or questions or comments that you want to add to anything about the Kabbalah or any, anything? No, this is outside my area. So I'm just kind of listening as a, you know, first time listener for a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah, so definitely. So, and then this, it also kind of triggers trickles into like hermetic Kabbalah, Kabbalah, Kabbalah. Um, and hermeticism itself is an area that I love to explore as, as well as I, you know, I'd love to get into the corpus hermeticum with you and, and maybe if um, it'd be possible for you to give an overview of what um, Hermeticism was or is and some of the origins and contents of, her of the Hermetica mm -hmm. um, and its prevalence and significance like within the Renaissance era or just kind of, you know, whatever you think about that. Sure. I'm actually teaching a class this, uh, this winter actually on Esoterica that's just the philosophical foundations for uh, hermeticism. Uh, so it's, it's a topic that's close to my heart as well. Um, hermeticism was a school of religious philosophy that existed in Alexandria sometime in the early uh, turn of the early common era. So we're thinking sometime probably roughly uh, maybe 100 to CE and after. Uh, we're not sure where it began and we're not sure when it ended. Um, probably it was it ultimately was eclipsed by Christianity but it seems to have existed for several hundred years, at least in the ancient world. And the basic idea of Hermeticism um, was that uh, Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes, uh, had received a kind of revelation from the world of the divine. And this uh, revelation uh, was a kind of salvific philosophy, which again, I think it's really important to understand Hermeticism is the combination of religion and philosophy into one package. And what it seems, right, in the, the literature that survives is a bit meager, actually. What it seems is that it seems like some kind of initiatory religious society in which by studying the revelations to Hermes Trismegistus, one could achieve a kind of salvific experience. One could be saved through the knowledge, through the philosophical knowledge of the fundamental nature of reality. Uh, and this included things like uh, the androgyne nature of God, that God was in fact uh, both genders, um, or both, yeah, both genders, um, that the world was structured in a certain kind of way, that the mind had uh, various kinds of powers, noose had various kinds of powers, mind had various kinds of powers that could perceive the divine in a way that uh, was basically uh, unavailable to most people. And so we know about this system of philosophy because um, some chunks of the teachings of this philosophy have survived. Um, we, one chunk of those is the Greek Corpus Hermeticum, which is uh, uh, about 20, 17 documents that have survived in ancient Greek. Uh, we have a couple of documents that have survived in Latin and Armenian and, several, and some, a couple other ancient languages, Coptic. And from what we can, well, from what we can tell, and again, we've, these documents have survived not systematically. So we have pieces of things at various stages of the initiatory processes. Um, and so it's sometimes it's difficult to reconstruct exactly what was going on in the in ancient Egypt, basically, and in, in turn of the turn of the common era Egypt. But the hermetic idea really takes off when these documents are basically recovered in the 15th century. Um, they're brought from Greece to Italy 
and Marsilio Ficino, uh, one of the great scholars of the uh, Italian Renaissance, in, actually interrupts his, uh, his study, his translation of Plato to translate the Corpus Semeticum. And he translates the first 14 tractates that we have in Greek and eventually uh, several other tractates are translated later. And the idea at the time, at least, is that Hermes Trismegistus actually either predated Moses or perhaps was even a teacher of Moses. And so you get the idea that, uh, at least in the Renaissance, that early is better, right? The earlier you get back to sort of uh, perfect knowledge way back in the day, that knowledge is somehow pure. And what we get in the Corpus Semeticum is this uh, pretty ancient philosophy and that this becomes all the rage. That's the idea in the Renaissance, right? Ad fontes, right? That's the battle cry of the, of the Renaissance, back to the sources. And if it's the case that Hermes Trismegistus was in fact the teacher of Moses, then in some sense, we even have a kind of pre-religious wisdom that is older even than, than the religion of Christianity or Judaism. Um, and then that those teachings can be transmitted and those teachings are somehow um, an uninter uninterrupted truth about the nature of reality. And so we get this rise in the interest of hermetic philosophy, uh, first in folks like Ludovico Lazzarelli. In fact, he was the first person to actually call himself a hermeticist. Uh, we never see that word in the ancient world. No one called themselves that in the ancient world. Uh, first person to call themselves that was Lazzarelli. Uh, and then, of course, we have other people to come along to be heavily influenced by these ideas, like uh, Giordano Bruno, uh, John Dee, um, uh, Pico della Mirandola, other kinds of people. And so what we have developing in the Renaissance and in the early modern period, uh, up till Kalsabon shows basically authoritatively that these documents do not date from that early period, we have the rise of a kind of para-Christian or maybe non-Christian sometimes, in the case with Bruto, uh, a kind of way of knowing about the divine that skirts uh, traditional Abrahamic religion. And this ecstatic way of knowing uh, the divine via this hermetic philosophy obviously has an enormous impact in the uh, Renaissance and early modern period. And it spawns, uh, in some ways, a kind of uh, hermetic Renaissance in many ways where uh, this idea, these ideas echo all the way out into the alchemical world, they echo out into the world of Christianism, and in some sense they echo out into uh, Freemasonry. And even to this day, uh, there are definitely people who are uh, uh, very interested in the idea of access to the, the, access to, to the divine not mediated by the Abrahamic uh, religious traditions, whether it be Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. And so this gives people access, uh, perhaps religious access to that um, without, without, without being uh, beholden to the Abrahamic traditions. Now I've heard Hermes as being synonymous with uh, Thoth, Egyptian Thoth. And I've heard also a correlation drawn between Hermes and Enoch. Does that ring true for you and your research? Have you ever come across that? It's certainly the case that uh, very early on it was uh, that it was it's certainly the case that very early on that Toth, the Egyptian god, and Hermes were combined into a kind of uh, syncretistic god. This was really common in the ancient uh, Greco-Egyptian or Greco-Roman situation, right? Where, for instance, Mercury and Hermes are basically combined as well. We see the linking of Hermes and Toth uh, pretty early on. Uh, they're they're similar kinds of gods. They do similar kinds of things. And so it makes a great deal. It makes a lot of sense to link them together in many ways. In fact, the phrase Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes, uh, that phrase uh, thrice great actually originally applies to Toth. And of course, Toth is the, um, or Tehuti, right, in ancient Egyptian, is the god of uh, literature, the god of writing, the god of magic. And of course, he's also associated with the underworld, which people also forget that Hermes is also associated with the, with the underworld, right? He's, uh, he's described in the Odyssey as, uh, as an escort into the underworld. And so this is a really good fit uh, for linking these two gods. Uh, Enoch also gets associated at some level with Hermes as well in later literature. Um, Enoch is this very mysterious character, of course, from the Hebrew Bible who uh, basically doesn't die and uh, somehow the Hebrew text says he, he simply walked with God and he was no more. He's one of these few characters that doesn't die. And especially in the early rabbinic literature, uh, for instance, in the, um, in the books of Enoch, uh, Enoch himself is actually transformed into this angelic being, Metatron. 
um, who's a very mysterious entity that um, there's a lot of debate about just what this entity is and, and how he functions in the, in the literature. So yeah, you get this kind of uh, linking between the three. Much more Hermes and Toth, less uh, Hermes and Enoch, but you have the idea that somehow uh, that Enoch is one of these characters that, that basically doesn't die and, and becomes a kind of div divinized entity. And of course, this gets very strange in the Enochian literature where uh, the, the, the quasi-divinized Enoch is not only turned into an angel, in some sense he's actually referred to as, as Yahweh Katan, which means little Yahweh, little, uh, little God. And so this entity is not just a, uh, an angel, but something like a, a lesser divine being. And there's a lot of debate about uh, exactly what that means and how this works out. And the rabbinical literature tries to really work this out so it's very, very mysterious exactly what role Enoch's playing in all this. Okay. And a, a heavy amount of the contents in the Corpus Medica make mention of a character named, I think it's Asclepius. There's the Universal Sermon of Asclepius, the Letter to Asclepius, the Definitions of Asclepius unto King Amon, etc. Who was this Asclepius? Um, yeah, Asclepius was the, the god of healing. Um, and this, uh, yeah, it's a god, basically the god of healing, uh, the caduceus, right? The image of the twisted snake is the, the image that you often see that represent. Uh, in fact, if in America, uh, if you have uh, insurance, often your insurance card and many will have this image actually on the insurance card or it's the image of, of various kinds of um, healing. Um, so Escalapius is one of the disciples of Hermes Trismegistus. In the Hermetic literature, we have several different disciples that we have named. Uh, Tot is one, Asclepius is another. And uh, in the Hermetic literature, uh, Hermes Trismegistus will often teach uh, Asclepius various kinds of truths. In fact, one of the longest uh, Hermetic documents that have survived from antiquity, although it doesn't survive in Greek, it survives actually in Latin, is a document called the Asclepius. And it's there that we actually get uh, a relatively long form discussion of many ideas to be found in hermetic philosophy. Um, uh, the definitions are also uh, preserved primarily, I think they're only preserved in Armenian. Um, and the definitions are the, in some sense, the closest document we have to being a kind of hermetic catechism. That is to say, uh, the hermetic definitions actually define they give us an insight into what we think the Hermetists define things like God, mind, being, nature, world, whatever. And so we get a, a running list of the how they defined all these things, which is very convenient because, as I mentioned earlier, the Hermetic corpus as it survives, it's pieces of things, right? It's just a piece here, a piece there, and a piece here. In fact, these pieces of all, all at least the Greek corpus hermeticum, was all basically preserved uh, as we know it by Byzantine scholars, and we're fairly confident that those Byzantine scholars uh, edited it in, in a way to make it more amenable to Christianity. So we're pretty sure that we've, uh, sometimes I call this the Byzantine filter, where it passed through a filter and we've, we're, we're, we're almost certain we've lost a great deal of material. Um, and so the definitions are really important because they provide us a really great insight into um, almost a systematic analysis of how the her Hermetists view, viewed the world. Uh, because again, what we actually have in the, in the hermetic literature are just pieces of things. For instance, um, in the Nagamati library, the famous uh, collection of Gnostic texts that were recovered in the mid 20th century in Egypt, uh, several hermetic texts were recovered there um, as well. But we know what's interesting about those hermetic texts is that they were actually reserved for people pretty far up the initiation cycle. Uh, so we don't have anything before that. So we don't know what you had to learn before you learned this text. In the text we actually have, it's very difficult to understand because obviously you would have studied a lot of texts before that, before you got to this one, but that's the only one we have. So, um, so when we look at the, the hermetic literature that survived, we have a kind of uh, uh, random assortment of things. And so it's quite difficult to, re to re put together exactly what these ancient people believed uh, and much less uh, what they did because we know that they had something like religious rituals um, for instance, a ritual, uh, ritual meal. Uh, we know that they, we think they were vegetarians and they had some kind of other ritual devices as well, but we have very little information about what those look like because again, we have this fragments of, of, this, uh, of this literature. Yeah, I wanted to get into magic, but some interesting areas, specifically ancient 
Israelite magic as well as ancient Christian magic. Um, I've been reading Eliphas Levy's The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic, uh, the John Michael Greer and Mark Anthony Ketuk uh, translation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe it was released in 2017. And Levy said uh, that magic is the science of the secrets of nature and that magic was known to the ancients as sanctum regnum, which in Latin translates to the holy kingdom or the kingdom of God. Um, was this an intuition or do you find truth in that statement? Um, if I remember correctly in a lecture you did on witchcraft, you had mentioned uh, most practicing magicians were actually of the priest class, yeah? Yeah, so we have good evidence that Christians have been doing uh, magic since the very beginning. Now, Christianity has a difficult relationship with magic. Uh, that is to say, uh, if we think about the origins of Christianity, part of its PR problem, we might say, was that it was a new religion. Uh, new religion in the ancient world was basically a nonsense idea. Religion, by definition, was old. Uh, and so the idea that Christianity's religion was new was, was a problem. Uh, the Romans didn't take that seriously. They thought that if you're you can't make a religion up. And we still have this idea, I think, that there's still an idea that, that religions can't be created from whole cloth now. There's still a prejudice against that. Um, and so one of the things that's weird about early Christianity is that while many early Romans and uh, Jews and pagans, they didn't take Christianity seriously as a religion, they did take Jesus seriously as a magician they did think that Jesus was basically able to accomplish the kind of miracles that he said that he could. So exorcism, healings, things like that, resurrecting people from the dead. They basically agreed that he could do that. In fact, the, the major, uh, one of the major critics of early Christianity, Celsus, uh, basically said, look, I think that Jesus could do these things, but he could do them not because he was the son of God, but because he was a magician. And so early on, Christianity had to work really hard to separate itself off from, Chris, from, uh, from magic, from sorcery. And there are numerous uh, statements in the New Testament where magic is forbidden. Now, at the same time, we have a, a copious amount of evidence from early Christianity, specifically Christianity as it was practiced in ancient Egypt. This is to say Egypt of the uh, early common era, where hundreds of spells have been recovered. And so we have very good evidence that Christianity, uh, Christians were engaging in, in magic. And of course, Christians would engage in magic all the way through the early, uh, through the classical period, all the way into the Middle Ages. And if, for instance, if you look at the many of the, the texts of ritual magic, what we might call ceremonial magic, or perhaps even necromancy, those forms of magic as they survived in the Middle Ages uh, are only basically understandable and only make sense and really are only possible by someone who has, for instance, a command of Latin, a command of the mass, a command of the kind of rituals that would, one would do in order to command demons and angels. And of course, the only people that have access to that kind of knowledge would be priests. They'd be people that were members of the Catholic Church. They would be people who were educated and people who would have access to things like books. And again, we shouldn't forget that books are very rare in the Middle Ages. And that the kind of people that are, have access to these kinds of things are going to be people that basically are either wealthy merchants or, in this case, educated uh, people in the priesthood. And so one can trace uh, all the way through the history of Christianity um, a flirtation, a very positive, active flirtation with magic. Now, is that, uh, to what degree is that, uh, is, are those kinds of things continuous? That's really hard to say. Uh, the church obviously actively suppressed magic. They were not very interested in people pra practicing magic, although that didn't stop them, of course. But the, the exact history of how these documents uh, migrated from northern Egypt uh, all the way across to, through North Africa or into Greece and then all the way over into Europe, this remains still basically an un, un, a, remains still a really difficult question to answer. Scholars still don't exactly know how these magical books, how these magical practices uh, were able to be transmitted uh, from in, in the way that they were, but we know they were. For instance, many of the magical symbols that have survived, even in a, even into contemporary magic, uh, these are the images of the uh, these little uh, ringlet shaped. Uh, there be there be lines with rings at the very beginning and end. I can grab a book and 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 point them out if you like. Um, those images uh, 
go all the way back to the very earliest forms of magic in the ancient uh, Greco-Egyptian context, uh, and they're still being used in contemporary magic, and we see them, of course, all through the Middle Ages, for instance, in uh, the books of Cornelius Agrippa, his three books of occult philosophy, they appear there. And we also see them uh, in several different necromancers manuals of the Middle Ages. So Christianity has a long relationship with magic. Now, of course, that relationship is um, fraught, right? It's certainly fraught, um, but a fraught relationship is a relationship you... okay. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, because we keep talking about this concept of magic, um, and how do you define the difference between a, you know, magic and a miracle? Can we kind of flesh that out? Because, you know, I think the word magic is used oftentimes, but sometimes we fail to define what that means. And, um, you know, for me, I take, you know, when I hear a word, you know, how it's used and then throughout history, how it's been used. Um, it seems to me that the difference, you know, from my view is that with magic, it's where the source would arise from. And then you do talk about a little bit, um, you know, well, I'll, I'll ask that question in a second, but I'm curious, how would you define the difference, I guess, between magic and a miracle? Yeah, this is a, this is a, a thorny issue, right? In fact, there's a book that just came out uh, several years ago. It's a 300 page analysis of trying to define magic. Uh, this is a very, very difficult issue. Uh, typically, the way that I use the word magic is that I think of magic as basically a polemical term. That is to say, magic is almost always being used as a way of othering a religious practice. So, for instance, even the word magia, the word that we now, we, the word we derive magic from, was a word that the Greeks, uh, the word a Greek, the Greeks used to define what the Persians did, the magi did. They did magia. And of course, the Greeks did not like the Persians, and the word magic always had a negative connotation. So typically, the way that I use the word magic, and I think the way many scholars use the word magic, is in some ways, uh, one of the definitions, the possible definitions, and the definition I'm using here, is something like it elicits supernatural activity. So a miracle, or prayer, for instance, or even transubstantiation, right, the idea that the priest could transmutate uh, the, uh, the bread into the body and the wine into the blood, that's basically a miracle. And of course, it's a miracle that occurs every day if you're a Catholic. Uh, but that is a licensed, that is a licit version of supernatural activity. Magic is in many ways an illicit uh, version of supernatural activity. And this is the reason why, for instance, in the Middle Ages, no one is going to refer to themselves as a sorcerer or a necromancer or a magician. They're going to say things like, no, I'm doing natural magic. I'm not doing uh, necromancy. And so there's an idea about here that the idea that magic is always what is forbidden at some level. So we might separate miracles and magic by talking about what, it, what a religion allows and what a religion doesn't allow. And what, are, for instance, Christianity, what it certainly does allow is for you, for instance, to pray that you be healed of a disease. And if you're healed of that disease, uh, that's great. God or God or a saint for, perhaps petitioned on your behalf to cure you. What's not allowed, for instance, would be you to uh, summon a demon and the demon actually heal you, right? That would be forbidden. Uh, notice both are supernatural causation but we would deem one magic and one a miracle. And the, the defining principle here, I think, at least in this case, is about what is allowed and what is not. So just to go, that actually prelates to my second question, because you had said that you believe that Jesus practiced magic. So my question to you is, can you give an example of a time where he practiced magic, where it would have to, in essence, go against, you know, something that was godly, per se? Right. So I, I wouldn't say that Jesus practiced magic myself. I, I would say that many of the early opponents of Christianity claimed that Jesus practiced magic, that he was a, he Did was a sorcerer. Did they give examples at all? Of something uh, so the example of, so Celsus is a pretty famous critic, uh, critic of Christianity, perhaps the most mm -hmm. famous. Um, in Celsus's book, which doesn't survive, it only survives in quotations from other books. But in Celsus's text, we have uh, Celsus describing uh, many of the miracles of Jesus, for instance, uh, the resurrection of the dead which again, resurrecting dead people would be typical of something like necromancy, right? If I were to go to a graveyard and resurrect a dead person for whatever reason, <clears throat> that would be a clear cut example of something like necromancy. Of course, but Jesus, if just to clarify, because, you know, the examples that are at least in the text are situations where 
you know, and I think it, it dives into also understanding the theology behind it and knowing the relationship between God and Jesus. And, you know, he's seen as the son of God, so mm -hmm. thereby an extension of God. Right. And, you know, perfect, not, not able to, to sin. So in that way, if he's bringing life to someone in the Bible, there's talk of eternal life and only God can give eternal life, you know, per se, Adam and Eve, when they were first created, they had eternal life. And then, you know, Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, and then so on and so forth. And they lost that privilege, right? So still, I guess, where I'm still looking for a really good example of you know, where it would be kind of out of line or in the realm of per se magic. I think, for instance, um, I mean, exorcism was also thought of as largely a magical practice. For instance, we have a great deal of exorcistic rituals that are preserved in the Greek magical papyri. And why uh, would that I, be magic? Come again? Why would that be magic if you're removing something, something evil or, you know, something that is uh, clouding? Let's say right. I think the idea. I think the idea there is that at least for people who are resistant to Christianity, right? Of course, for Christians, it was simply God working God's business. For sure. non-Christians, uh, of course, there were lots of exorcistic operators in the ancient world. Uh, they would see this idea of uh, of that affecting these supernatural causes would be typical of many kinds of, of magical practices. Uh, for instance, Jesus uh, removing blindness by spitting into uh, mud and applying it to the eyes and causing the scales to fall off. This would be something that many people in the ancient world would have looked at and thought, yeah, this is basically how all magicians operate or sorcerers operate. But don't the ends have to justify the means in that sense? I think that for me is what differentiates, you know, magic from miracles is that if your, you know, means are to get to an ends that is something that releases that person of an ailment or something very negative, than the means that you use to get there, so long as no one is harmed. I mean, you know, spitting in someone's eye, it might seem very odd to us because we're living in a different century, you know, and we have this concept of germs and all of these things. Um, but I'm curious still, you know, how that would be seen, I guess, as even from a non-Christian person, you know, because you can look at religion from a very uh, philosophical and academic view, I think, any religion, and kind of break it apart and see logic behind it. And then you see kind of the, you know, mystical side of it right but in those situations i think that um you know if you break it down and say okay well what was the purpose and the ultimate goal i think even a non-religious person i don't see them as seeing seeing that as magic right and when you say magic i also want to because i think a lot of people also think of the word magician right as we hear we see them now right no that's stage magic yeah and they actually the greek actually the greeks actually had a, a specific word for mm -hmm. for stage magic like that is to say illusions for entertainment, which they knew were not, exactly. which they knew were not real. Exactly, right, okay, uh, that's, that's, what, not, that's what I was getting at, yeah. Yeah, certainly not that. No, um, no, the idea there, right, is that, um, and again, you even see this, this complaint in the New Testament where the, uh, the rabbis, the rabbinical authorities of the time are claiming that Jesus is able to accomplish, for instance, exorcisms, but he's using one demon to drive out another, right? He's using uh, Beelzebub to drive out Baal, and there's this idea, and this, of course, this idea is a very common idea that goes back all the way to the ancient Near East, where uh, the demon Pazuzu is used to scare off the demon Lamashtu. There's the idea that you can actually summon demons to fight other demons, which is a really interesting kind But of isn't there a difference, you say, using a demon to, you know, to do something good? Well, I think, to me, magic, you have to look at the source of the magic. Like, for instance, in different practices, you have dark magic, you have different kinds of magic. And the, the differentiating factor is the source of that magic. And so Jesus, I mean, I, I don't think that I've heard anyone that studied the history of, you know, what he's believed to be, whether they're religious or not, who said his source was ever claimed to be something else from God. So he wasn't using demons to drive out demons. He was well, using a good, God a good, to drive a out demons. Of, I mean, there's a, a good bit of literature, especially in the Jewish world and other contexts where Jesus is thought of as being a deeply heretical dangerous uh but does it use actions to describe oh, yeah, or does like it you, just kind of use talk because a, a sorcerer and just so you know I'm, I'm challenging you a bit because i am an attorney yeah, <laughs> so yeah. i like to i like to always kind of play both sides on and really challenge these questions because sometimes you know Actually. getting to the root is it's in, it's interesting no, for sure and i think like yeah. again jesus is one of these characters where it depends on what you want to find right so if you if you want to find a uh a charlatan sorcerer and that's certainly what 
early Judaism thought of Jesus, and it's certainly what medieval Judaism thought of Jesus, and it's certainly what pagans thought of Jesus. Jesus, they basically thought Jesus was a kind of sorcerer. Um, and they thought, well, there's lots of sorcerers. Lots of people can do this kind of stuff, right? Uh, and so that's part of the reason why Jesus, uh, the Jesus movement in some cases among intellectuals never caught on because they were like, yeah, lots of people can do this kind of sorcery. What well, big whoop. Um, and in, in the Jewish tradition, there's a longstanding idea that, that he was basically a, a illegitimate child that had learned sorcery in Egypt and you know, engaged in all this sort of uh, basically heretical evil stuff. Uh, and I guess that depends to what you, you know, when you read the history, what you take from it and what you believe and don't believe as far as sure. you know, looking think, through the text and there's so much written and it's, Absolutely. it's difficult. I, I mean, you're, you. you know, you're evaluating a culture that's in existence before we ever were, and we have difficulty evaluating our culture as it is now. No, <laughs> right? Right. I, I think, again, Jesus is, uh, as, what is it, Xenocrates, the famous Greek philosopher said that uh, the... Uh, one group of people think that their God is, is redheaded and white. And one people think that their God is dark headed and, and black. And one people think that their, their God is like this and they're all wrong. Right. Uh, and I think that Jesus is one of these great examples where because we know so little, it's able, we're able to backfill that story in with basically whatever we like. And so Christians of course, backfill that story in with he's the son of God and he can accomplish all these things because of his, um, his divine nature. When I'd like to say, just to clear the record, I think, some Christians do that, right? Just like, for instance, there might be a person who claims to be Christian and they murder someone, right? And so you always have outliers, just like in Judaism and in different faiths. Um, you have different people who are part of a larger group and they do an action and then they, the entire group gets labeled as this is what all of them think. So, but yes, I believe that some of them do. There's a great book. I mean, there's an interesting book by Morton called Jesus the Magician. Uh, that actually analyzes it makes a claim that Jesus was a kind of uh, was a was a kind of magician. Um, what we also know from the Galilee at that time, uh, and this is getting a bit more in the weeds of it, mm -hmm. but um, the Galilee at that time, around the time of Jesus, both before and after he existed, that region of Judea was active and known for what's the right word, miracle working rabbis of some kind. Um, and we know of several of these, one of them being Choni the Circle Maker and another being Chanina Bendosa. Uh, Choni the Circle Maker existing, living a generation before Jesus or a couple generations before Jesus and Chanina Bendosa living a couple generations after, actually just right after. And that entire region was known for these kind of characters. Um, and we have accounts of both of their miracles. Uh, and we have what's interesting about both of their miracles is that even within Judaism, their miracles were disputed. Meaning some people thought that they were miracles and some people thought they were sorcery. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a debate about should, uh, for instance, Choni the circle maker is famous for uh, drawing a circle, right? And standing inside that circle and then basically forcing God to make it rain. And many rabbis found this to be not okay. Like you're <laughs> using magic to make God do stuff. That's not okay. Um, and, and many rabbis wanted to have him excommunicated and some rabbis didn't. And what's funny is that he's now accepted within the Jewish canon. And so is Chanin de Bendosa, who was a pretty famous exorcist and he did other kinds of miracles as well. Uh, Shimon Bar Yochai, the alleged uh, writer of the Zohar, uh, also from this exact same region. And in many ways also uh, he could shoot lasers from his eyes and allegedly he survived in a cave with his son for many years. And there's all these miracle stories associated with these guys. So when we zoom back to that time period and zoom back to that context, Jesus fits very comfortably in with a host of these kind of uh, miracle working first century uh, rabbinical characters um, in fact, I think had Jesus not become central to Christianity, he would have been accepted back into Judaism just fine, and he'd have been famous basically as a kind of miracle worker and exorcist. Um, so the line between Very magic, politics, right, and, and again, this is famous line, right, the, what separates uh, one man's freedom fighters and another man's terrorists, right, this is a line we often, I think, say now, right, one man's magician and one man's miracle worker, it all depends on the perspective you have. If you think the person's doing supernatural stuff legitimately, they're a miracle worker. If you think they're not, they're a magician. And yeah, so what, what's interesting about whether Jesus, for instance, is a magician or a sorcerer or a miracle maker, that tells us more about us than it does about Jesus, 
right? It tells us more about what we think and what we believe as opposed to what Jesus, in fact, thought about himself or even what the people around him thought about himself. Right. And so these terms are often revelatory because um, they're, for instance, the word witch is a great example. No one in the Middle Ages basically would have ever called themselves a witch. They would have called themselves a cunning person. Now, if you're being tried, the prosecutor would have called you a witch because witch is a juridical <laughs> term, right? Now, when you're declared a witch, right, then mm -hmm. you're, there's a certain set of things that are allegedly true about you. For instance, you've made a diabolical pact and you're trying to actively subvert Christianity. But none of that may be true about you. And so the term witch or maleficia is, or witchcraft in this case, that's a legal term, right, that basically always meant you were bad. No one called themselves that. Whereas now, of course, many, many people call themselves witches and they call themselves witches enthusiastically. But in, for instance, the Middle Ages, uh, you would not have had someone actively going into the town square saying, I'm a witch, any more than you would have someone walking into Washington, D.C. calling themselves a terrorist. Uh, I'm sure that bin Laden and, uh, and these people died thinking that they were freedom fighters uh, or whatever demented ideas they had. But again, this is a great, uh, gonna, another good example, right, where a term like witch always has, at least in the Middle Ages, a, a, a legal valence that was negative, whereas for now, right, that term is a much more ambiguous or perhaps even positive term, I think, primarily. Right. So, Historically, uh, we, we love to stigmatize certain words and concepts to, to meet our needs, right? <laughs> I think. Absolutely. And again, like, in religion and politics. Absolutely. And so, yeah. um, and so this is why I think it's very important, and it gets good you ask this question, because um, we often use phrases like magic and witch and things like this in a very uh, unsystematic way. And my, the way that I approach studying these techniques, uh, the, these sub subjects, is almost always to let people identify themselves. So if I study a person and they never call themselves a magician, I don't call them that. Because that word might have a valence that is anachronistic or, or, or uncharacteristic of what they thought they were doing. Um, and so I think it's very important that, um, for instance, the good example is hermetism, right? Or, uh, yeah, hermetism is a great example. No one in antiquity called themselves a hermeticist. They just didn't. We call them that, right? Or Gnostic is another great example. We don't have anybody calling themselves a Gnostic in the ancient world. Just, just don't call themselves that. So when we use a phrase like Gnostic or Gnosticism and we put that label on people, we're putting them in a box we've created not a box that they have chosen for themselves. And often these artificial boxes that we put onto people, especially ancient peoples, medieval peoples, it distorts our ability to really understand themselves, how they understood themselves, what they're doing, how they, uh, how they understood how they were practicing things. And it makes us more comfortable, but that's not the point. The point of history is to understand them and their context, not to put them into a box that makes them comprehensible to us. Right. I think that's not right. And I think people tend to do that because it's more convenient to kind of stereotype and categorize. And then you don't have to do the guesswork of really figuring out and defining, you know, each of the things that really make up a person because it's it's very complex, I think. And also it just when you go to history. Yeah. And also I think it, it allows us to say that we know things that we don't. And I think that a really important one very important phrase that every person who wants to study this material should get very used to saying is, I don't know. Absolutely. We, yeah. we don't know. Like when I teach this material, I have students ask me, what did they, what did the hermeticists, what did the Gnostics believe about this? And I'm like, we don't know. Like, what did the Vikings think about this? We don't know. Um, and so uh, when we put these boxes on people, it allows us to make assumptions about them that are unfair. And so often and if, if you've had the chance to you know, watch my, her, uh, Esoterica, uh, a great deal of what I say on Esoterica makes some people very uncomfortable because I have to say, I don't know. We don't know. We don't have this literature. It doesn't survive. This text is very corrupt. We don't know what it says. Um, and that's what separates perhaps my approach from maybe the more guru approach where I, a guru pretends to have all the answers and I don't. I just don't. Well, that, it's one of the wisest things you can say because, I mean, really, the, the more that you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And um, in undergrad, I studied communication theory and sociology, and there's um, uncertainty reduction. And there's this correlation between the unknown and fear. The more uncertainty that you have about something, 
the more fear is present because you're not comfortable because right. the essence of not knowing about something is not knowing what to expect. So you don't know yet how to respond. And for many people, I think that's why they get into these routines and these kind of automatic responses is because it's comfortable, but they're, they're escaping that, that whole world that opens up if you take yourself out of that comfort zone and you explore the unknown, because then you do gain a certain level of comfort slowly. And then you keep diving back in, I think, for more. So I think it's wise that you do that. That's Yeah, yeah not, not knowing is, again, I always tell people, not knowing is a default position that every human being is born into. We don't know. And it's fine not to know. There's no moral failure in not knowing. And I, I study texts all day, every day, in which uh, I'll get to, I was just reading this alchemical text for one of the later episodes of uh, Esoterica. And I got to a section in this, uh, the alchemical text where I read Latin pretty well and I hit a brick wall. And I'm like, this in these entire three sentences, I just don't know what they're saying. And rather than trying to make up something for the episode, I just basically in the episode said, and then it gets really weird here. And I, I don't know, hell if I know, like, uh, and maybe I'm not meant to know, or maybe I'm just not initiated uh, and uh, whatever. It doesn't really matter why I don't know. But I think it's really important in the study of Western esotericism to be really comfortable with the fact that we're probably not going to know a lot of this stuff. And then often when people come along uh, pretending that they have all the answers, uh, it's a pretty clear indicator that those are untrustworthy people in my experience. Now, the exactly. people that have all the answers are the people that <laughs> typically have the fear. Those are the ones you have to be worried about because, I mean, the lawyer's way of we don't know is it depends. We always yeah. joke about that. But um, yeah, it's it's odd because, you know, with Sky, we when we do podcasts, I really like having the guests who who don't know because when they talk, you perceive and you listen and you know that they know a lot. You know, by them just saying I don't know, it's you see that they do. And it's that they're they're realizing there's still so much to learn. I mean, you could live a thousand years and still never learn everything. Sure. So yeah. I like where this is going. There's a lot of important points that you guys are touching on. Um, it's getting really good. I have a few questions that might add some value to this previous conversation. Um, now, you mentioned that magic was forbidden in the New Testament. Do you know who specifically was calling for this ban on magic? Um, would this be like the Pharisees or who, who was this overseeing force? That was kind of... Um at least in the New Testament, we have in several of, several of the epistles uh, that are attributed to Paul. Of course, uh, scholars think that m only seven of the epistles that we have in the New Testament are actually written by Paul. The rest of them, we don't know who wrote them. Uh, both ones attributed to Paul and both ones not attributed to Paul uh, condemn various forms of magical practice. Uh, of course, they condemn them along with other kinds of things like drunkenness and fornication and things. So um, they, they see... The, the writers of those texts see sexual immorality, for instance, very much like they would see magic, which also, by the way, just tells you how common magic was, right? Like sexual immoralities, I mean, are sexual, I mean, whatever people, people do, people do things that are perceived by other people uh, sexually as incorrect all the time. And so the idea here is that, or drunkenness, I mean, you can, obviously there was a great deal of drunkenness in the world then, and certainly there is now, um, especially these days. Um, <laughs> Coronavirus is probably pushing us all to drink. Right. Um, to be very frank, um, and so uh, the the New Testament clearly forbids these practices, and of course they're also forbidden in the Hebrew Bible. Although uh, the uh, the for the the laws forbidding uh, magic in the Hebrew Bible are very mysterious. Um, they're still not well understood in modern even modern linguistics. There's still a lot of uh, debate about exactly what these words actually mean. There's about eight different words in Hebrew for various kinds of, of magics, uh, sorceries, and they're, these are still a bit mysterious. We can talk about those if you like as well. Um, but basically there's the idea early in Christianity that they do not want to be associated with magic. They, want to, they, they really want to focus on the idea that Jesus was uh, in some sense in the God incarnate. And because you can, one can appeal to Jesus one can basically sort of get a direct line. You can text God, so to speak, and God can intervene in your, in your specific circumstances. 
Um, and this idea persists all the way into modern Christianity, where the idea is basically you, um, you don't circumvent God, right? There's an idea that by attempting to circumvent God and command supernatural powers on your own, which of course early Christianity thought was very possible, then one is in some sense opening the door up to malevolent influ influences. Of course, Augustine uh, said, look, one can do magic. Magic is effective, uh, but it's always the case that it's demons doing it. Uh, and demons are doing these magical things in order to basically ensnare your soul. And of course, that line, uh, that idea from St. Augustine became the standard interpretation of why magic was both wrong and dangerous, but real all the way through, I think, even contemporary Christianity. So Christianity never denies that magic is real. It just says it's wrong. It's, it's dangerous. And so yeah. in, in the New Testament or the Old Testament, it, it says that it's wrong and dangerous, but does it give any reasoning behind this or is it kind of just really vague about that? It depends, yeah, it's very I mean, it depends on who you ask, but you would get different answers. Um, if someone argue that it's because the source would be drawn from something other than God. So for instance, you know, when you, when you hear some people talk about prayer, there's, you'll hear a number of different rules. Some people say you should never pray for yourself. You know, you, depending on which denomination, Christianity, um, Judaism, different things. But if, you know, a person were to, for instance, pray and say, um, I pray for this to happen, and I don't care if it's the will of God, that would be, you know, regardless, something that you shouldn't do, you know, according to the text. Um, however, if you're, you know, praying for something you say, as long as it's in God's will, um, or not even saying as long as it's in God's will, but it's presumed that that's what you are wanting, then that would be deemed as okay. So, you know, traditionally magic, you'd be drawing for some, from something else. Um, the Bible also talks about psychics and it, you know, in the text, it states that that's a very real thing, but it also says that that's not something that should be, you know, practiced as, you know, for telling the future. So it doesn't go too much into it, um, at least the text that, you know, that we have. Yeah. In the, in that's the Hebrew Bible, the, the prohibitions are very curt. Uh, for instance, the most famous prohibition is to be found in Exodus 22, uh, where in the Hebrew, it's just three words, right? Uh, it literally says, uh, which literally in Hebrew just means sorceress, don't let live, right? That's all it says. And it, it's, it, and it, it, the, it's so curt. Uh, in other places in the Hebrew Bible, where it forbids it, it says, lo, 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 don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. It never says... Uh, why not? And I think that the underlying reasoning probably is theological. That is to say uh, that the, the, the developing monotheism of the Hebrew Bible is very anxious about the idea of supernatural causation outside of God, because that is basically disruptive of the idea of an absolute monotheism, to say that God is basically the only being capable of doing these things, that if one can go to um, what the Hebrew Bible calls a ba'alat, a uh, ba'alat ov, uh, which this word is we basically don't know what this word means. Uh, it means something like mistress of the ove, whatever the ove was. Uh, and we have the idea in the Hebrew Bible uh, that she can summon the dead. Um, well, the idea there is that this seems to be the power of life and death. And that seems to be typically attributed, especially to God. And the worry there, of course, is that if you, if you tinker with the powers of life and death and you have power over the powers of life and death, then at some level, this is uh, associating you with divine power and that is an, a, a no-no in many ways in, in the way that ancient Israelite theology developed. So I think that the, the underlying worry is that it's, uh, it's, it's a threat at some level to, to God's power that one manipulates these supernatural forces. And again, you even see this in debates around luck uh, in early Christianity, around whether tuke, the idea of fate, is a real thing in astrology. Because if fate is real, if luck is real, uh, and then you can do things to affect your luck, right? Like, I don't know, wear a rabbit's foot or something. Um, then where's God in all that? If there's this other force out there in the universe, and of course, in, in Anglo-Saxon, right, this force was called weird, which is where we get the word weird from. Um, this idea of the weird was out there in the world, and one could affect one's weird, or that weird could, uh, could uh, weird was a thing that was going to happen to you no matter what. Uh, in uh, the Anglo-Saxon poet uh, poem, the, the Wanderer, right? It says, "Weird bis erad," that that weird is utterly unchangeable. 
Well, that seems theologically problematic, of course, in, in, in a Christian worldview in which God is in control, not weird or fate or magic or whatever. And so this is, I think, at the underlying worry is that monotheism, the basic structure of monotheism is that, you know, Jesus take the wheel. God's in control of everything. And if there are these other forces out there that one can manipulate, then this is a, a basically a theological threat to, to God's uh, or could it, Just to kind of spin off on that, because um, I view it from somewhat of a different angle. I think of fate as something where, you know, to me, I don't think it goes against what, you know, at least would be in the text, because you have uh, free will. And, you know, throughout different texts, uh, biblical, Old Testament, New Testament, it talks about this concept of, you know, turning away, right, from God's will. And, you know, whether people, according to their faith, believe that we're here for, you know, some greater purpose or to get to heaven or whatever it may be, you have that choice to turn away from certain things and to go towards certain things. And if you choose to turn away from that, I think that the common theme also is in the Old Testament when it talks about, um, you know, when God threw Satan out of heaven, because originally he was one of his angels. And he was cast out of heaven because he wanted to have the power that God possessed. And I think if you dive a little bit deeper, you could argue that the danger with wanting that power is that if God is innately good and represents everything pure, and someone who wants that power, not out of a need to do good, but the, again, the ends have to justify the means, um, but a need for the recognition versus to do things that help others then that power can be used for a very bad thing. And I think that's where that interplay sometimes comes in, at least in the theology of it. And certainly in Christianity. I mean, Judaism sure. typically, uh, at least Israelite theology, seemed to not even have a devil character at all. Uh, mm -hmm. That the, the, the Satan, like, of course, the, the word Satan only occurs in Hebrew as a title. It's the Satan, ha-Satan. So it's always the Satan. It's never a name. It's always a, a title in, in the Hebrew text, at least. Um, in fact, they seem chummy, weirdly, in Job and other texts. Um, and so it's only later in Christianity where you get this idea of a parallel evil entity. Um, that seems to be largely a Christian innovation. Judaism never really... Judaism Does never... Judaism, go ahead. Yeah, Judaism never develops a kind of a satan, an, an adversarial evil character in the same way that Christianity does. So uh, in, in Islam as well. In Judaism, um, Genesis is part of the text. Or am I wrong? Correct me because yep. this is okay. Yep. So when it talks about the serpent in Judaism, is that not seen as um, a Satan? No, no. There's a lot of debate about what that the Nachash, the snake, uh, the snake was. Uh, and in fact, if you read that text carefully, especially in the original language, um, one of the cross-cultural things that we notice when we see comedy is puns. Puns are funny for whatever reason. Uh, puns are punny. Um, but the, the idea, right, that punning is, is meant to be funny. Um, in the Hebrew text, the text puns a lot. Uh, for instance, the, the snake, the nachash, is thought of as arum, clever, but the people are naked, arumim. And so the well, it text, doesn't actually ever say snake, does it, though? It yeah, says serpent. serpent. Yeah, serpent. Okay. In Hebrew, nachash is just the word for okay, snake. Okay, so, so serpent same, means... Same word in, same word in okay. Hebrew. Okay. And that, yeah. I, that I wasn't aware of because, um, you know, my studies have been of like the Latin text and different. So, and in Christianity, there's the, the debate as to what the serpent was, right? right? Because it describes that it was on its belly and didn't have legs and things like that. But. Right. Yeah. And so there's, a, there's an entire, you know, read of the text that make, basically makes the entire Genesis story kind of like a, a comedy, a comedy of errors, um, rather than sort of a Titanic fall in the way that we have it, for instance, in the way that theology developed in Christianity and John Milton. But yeah, the, the snake in that story is sometimes even the good guy. And there are some Jewish texts where he's, the snake is actually a good guy, where the snake is actually working for God. And it's basically meant to, uh, it's a coming of age story where the human beings are living in blissful ignorance and they, have to, they basically have to come out of that ignorance and they don't want to. And so they have to be goaded out of it. And the way they do that is God actually sends the Nachash to do it. Um, and of course, that's why God asks, asks these rhetorical questions like, where are you? As if God doesn't know. Um, so no, Judaism never really develops robustly a, uh, a devil character, right? That's sort of a, a chief architect of evil. In fact, in uh, the, the prophet Isaiah, uh, which is one of the more radical monotheistic texts, 
uh, God actually declares, right? Ani tov vera, ani or v'choshech, uh, I am good and evil, I am light and darkness, where basically God is, the buck stops with God. And so the Satan character, the Satan character that is to be found in, for instance, the book of Job, uh, and other places in the Hebrew Bible, Zechariah, um, that character, at least in Judaism, is thought of as basically working for God. Uh, and you'll appreciate this being an attorney, that, uh, that, the, that the Satan is basically the prosecuting attorney of heaven. That is to say that uh, the Satan uh, looks at what human beings do and then rushes over to God and says, look how bad the human beings are. They're doing X and Y. And then, of course, what always happens is that, that the uh, Satan only sees one side of the story. And it's kind of like a cosmic tattletale. And then once the Satan realizes, oh, they were doing X, but really they were doing Y, uh, God, you know, embarrasses the Satan and shows that the Satan uh, is... Uh, incorrect in their assessment or overzealous in their prosecution. And so basically what you get in, the, in, the, in Judaism is that the Satan is a kind of overzealous prosecutor uh, who I doesn't have- I love that, that word idea. overzealous. Huh? <laughs> I love that word overzealous. We, we actually had this long conversation about how they removed that from um, professional responsibility because they used to say you had to be a zealous attorney and they changed it because attorneys were getting a little too zealous. A little so. too zealous, yeah. This is <laughs> So again, in Judaism, the, now that's not to say there's not evil in Judaism. Uh, there's a very elaborate, uh, several, Judaism is a very old religion. And so it's gone through many phases in its history. And so, and because there's no central authority, many different uh, schools of Judaism have arisen. And in some cases, you do have a very robust demonology with very evil creatures that are lurking around. Uh, the Zohar, for instance, uh, that we've mentioned earlier is an incredibly, is a text very concerned uh, with demons and with evil and the nature of evil, uh, especially the origin of demons and uh, wasted semen, which is the Zohar is very worried about uh, semen not being used correctly, that if semen is spilt on the ground and these uh, demons use it to make other demons, and it's this very uh, shocking image, really, of how demons emerge from sexual, from masturbation and things like this. Um, and is there, yeah. is there a heaven and a hell in Judaism? It's debate. There's a debate about this. Uh, so some schools of Judaism say yes that there is a, there there are there is heaven and hell. Some Ju some forms of Judaism uh, in the Kabbalah accept reincarnation. Uh, reincarnation is very common in Judaism. Uh, some say that there is heaven and hell, but that uh, that hell is temporary. That one can, in fact, the the Talmud says that one can only stay there for 360, uh, 363 days or whatever. One can't stay there a whole year or something. Uh, there's a lot of debate. And of course, the joke, right, is if you go ask a rabbi what they think about the afterlife, they'll tell you they don't know because they're not dead yet. Um, <laughs> Judaism doesn't, Judaism is a religion very much focused on the here and now. Mm -hmm. It's very much focused on observing Jewish law. It's very much uh, focused on these things. And typically speculation about those issues is, is not encouraged. Although there, of course, there's enormous literature where that speculation occurs. But Judaism just doesn't think of itself as a religion future oriented. It really thinks of itself as a, a, a now oriented or another way of putting it is that Judaism is not a religion of orthodoxy. It's not a religion about belief. It's a religion about practice. So, so more, I, what I hear you saying, it's kind of more about obedience or, or faith based, right? Um, when earlier we were talking about, you know, when the Bible talks about certain things or different texts talk about certain things for religions, and it doesn't describe them. And it, it reminded me, I'm a parent. So I think of when my daughter asks me a question and I say, because I told you so. something, And it, it reminds me of that because when I do that, it's me exerting my authority that you need to follow what I'm telling you because I know what's best and I have her good intention. And so would you kind of compare it to that, that if you follow the laws and the rules, that it's the obedience that is admirable yeah, that's, I mean, in, in many ways, I mean, Judea, and of course there are uh, texts that try to describe why the rules are the way that they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the rabbis are much more concerned day to day with you eating the right thing as opposed to anything else. But that's not to say there's not an enormous amount of mysticism. I mean, you can see behind me, basically that's a wall of mystical texts. They're there. Um, but Judaism largely deprioritizes that kind of stuff um, because it's much more concerned with day-to-day -day life uh, and day-to-day -day practice. 
but again, not to say that Judaism doesn't have a massive mystical background and there's all kinds of, you know, uh, all kinds of, again, mystical speculation. There's a very long tradition of Jewish magic uh, that's very interesting. Um, I have a couple of Jewish magical texts behind me that are printed several hundred years ago. Um, so it's there as well, but it's a, it's a more of a, more of a minority current. Well, I think it's, it's interesting that it does focus on, you know, following certain practices because just in life in general, when you look at different cultures, there's this theme um, in various cultures of doing certain things and practicing them, you know, exactly how they're supposed to be practiced. And through that process, when you actually do that in different walks of life, you learn things that you cannot ever grasp just by reading about it or by learning or trying to pick it apart and understand it. You, sometimes you have to do it to go, ah, aha, I get it. And then it clicks together. So mm -hmm. it's yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that, again, I don't, I don't know that I, I practice Judaism and I don't know that I do it because I think that there's some God that will punish me because I do or don't do it. But when I practice, for instance, kashrut, the laws of kosher, it makes me think about food, like what I eat and what I don't eat and why. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a healthy practice that right. you know, everybody could benefit from thinking, where does my food come from? What is it made of? Like, like why, why, why should I eat this and not eat that? Uh, of course, Judaism structures that in a very specific kind of way. Uh, I think you could structure it in many other kinds of ways that are perfectly legitimate. But uh, again, I, uh, when I think about my practice as, as a Jewish person, I'm not thinking, well, if I wear a suit made of wool and cotton or, or wool and linen, God's going to punish me. Uh, but it does make me think about how did my clothes get made? And I think that's a really interesting question that may reveal things about consumption and consumerism that I think are worthwhile questions that all of us uh, should be asking, especially of those of us who have moral considerations around sweatshops and things like that. Absolutely. We, that. Uh, we just purchased um, 38 acres up north and we're running everything off the grid and we have goats and ducks. And so it's it's been very interesting because going from a very professionalism type life to literally running a farm, it's, there's, there's something, I get more enjoyment out of that than I do practicing law. It's very odd and I can't describe why. So That's easy for me to imagine, but. <laughs> um, so yeah, I love that kosher note that you touched on and I've actually described that to people as well just personally my my diet and what I'm eating and if I'm consuming fast food versus something organic or whatever to me it may, may not be for somebody else but for me that I could relate that to me feeling as if I'm sinning or deviating or whatever because that doesn't make me feel good I'm essentially doing something short-term pleasurable that's going to have you know long-term negative effects or whatever so I, I like that you mentioned that but um I wanted to get back to something like with the luck thing and gaining powers from other gods and goddesses or whatever. It, it seems to me that all these other forces emanated as extensions of God or the singular original source in some capacity that they may be forces that people are tapping into and naming as gods, but that seems like a relative opinion and not a truth. And I'm just wondering if, if there's anything that you can speak to about that, do you, do you think that with all these different forces and, and other demons and all this, are these just forces that people might may be tapping into over time and then they're naming something because of certain function they can do related to a certain ritual or what are your thoughts on that? Um, it's hard for me to say what people are doing. Yeah. What people are doing and why, um, at least from the point of view, for instance, of thinking about, uh, at least I can speak of ancient Israel and maybe early Christianity, um, there's a real debate, uh, at least in early Christianity. And, and, and it's interesting that in ancient Israel, for instance, monotheism does not emerge uh, all at once. Monotheism is, a, is an idea that emerges over time. And so when you see, for instance, in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, where it says things like, I don't know, Right? It says, who is like you among the gods, O Yahweh? I don't think that's a rhetorical question. I really do think that in a pretty fundamental way, the ancient Israelites believed that there were other gods, just that their God was the best God. Their God was their God. 
And so what ends up happening over time is that as Christianity emerges and as monotheism really takes, uh, takes, can, takes position, the Christians especially have to decide what to do with all the other gods. Um, and uh, what the Jews basically do is say that the other gods are just not real. They're just illusions or something. But the Christians make the more interesting move of basically making them all into demons. And so all of the other gods, uh, for instance, the Greek and Roman gods and the Egyptian gods become these demonic forces. And the idea there is that these demonic forces, according to Christianity, and there are different theories of this, how it goes in Christianity, but the, one of the earliest ways that the early Christians think about this is that the, uh, the structure of the heavens, the actual heavens themselves, the planets, that we, the, the entities we now call planets, are, are entities. They're, they're creatures that actually live in the heavens. And these creatures have various kinds of powers and that one can, through various kinds of mechanisms, uh, uh, what we now typically refer to as astral magic, one can manipulate these entities uh, in various kinds of ways, harnessing their powers in order to accomplish various kinds of tasks. Um, and we see this idea all the way through the Middle Ages, uh, even through, uh, uh, in fact, one of the earliest people to be executed for practicing magic in Europe, uh, Cecco de Ascoli was, um, wrote a commentary where he basically argued that these sort of demonic entities that live in the, the heavens can be manipulated to do magical tasks. Um, so basically, again, what we're, what we're seeing, at least from an academic viewpoint here, is religions having to adapt to their conditions and then reinterpret their world in a way that conforms with the theological beliefs that they have. And the theological beliefs, of course, of Christianity is that you have a world basically populated with angels and demons. And there are many competing theories about where, for instance, these demons come from. And one of them basically is that they become, they're basically all of the gods that people were worshiping in the late classical pagan world. And those entities sort of get, I don't know, the opposite of baptized, whatever that is, demonified. And these entities become the various kinds of uh, demons. Um, what's also that, if, if I can ask, because I have not, I haven't gotten that from the study of Christianity. Um, the study that I've found is, for instance, the story of Moses and, you know, the plagues that were released because he was trying to get Pharaoh to let his people go. Um, actually, Pharaoh's advisors worshipped what he called false, false gods. And in the biblical text, um, it disregards them as non-existent. And the, you know, the sin was to worship a false god because it was a non-existent god. And, you know, there's debate as to what, what that can encompass. You know, people can call money a false god if you worship it to the extent that you're prioritizing it, you know, in a sense of power. And that is my understanding, the demonic and angel relationships were more uh, spiritual forces that were, you know, negative spiritual forces that came from, you know, Satan right. um, and different concepts related to hell versus angels, which are, you know, supposed to be creatures that are God's warriors, right, per se, in the Christian faith. Yeah, at least in the Hebrew Bible, there, there isn't much in the way of demons. It's amazing how few entities there are, demonic entities there are in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, they're, they're, you can count them on one hand, basically, and even the angels are very mysterious. But what's interesting, for instance, of the, quest, the story you mentioned, right, the, the Pharaoh's advisors were able to, you know, uh, one of the things that's interesting about that story, right, is that they were able to convert their staves into snakes. Um, and funny, that's the word actually for those, for those advisors, they're referred to as hachamim, the wise ones. And then in another case, they're actually referred to as, uh, as the chartume uh, mitzrayim, the this is a weird word to translate. They're referred to as uh, the people from Khartoum living in Egypt, uh, which is very weird that they're the actual name there for the word you translate in English as magician actually refers to where they're from. They're I was from going Khartoum. to say that's, that's interesting because from what I understood um, is that when they did that, it was an illusion. Yeah. And there was some sort of, you know, magic in the sense of kind of modern day terminology where they did these tricks per se. Um, and then, you know, you get further on in the text and it talks about, they tried to replicate certain things that Moses did and they couldn't. They couldn't, they couldn't do all of it, but they could do some right. of it. Um, and that's what, you know, of course, in the story with the snakes is that, uh, that what, what wins the magical duel there is that the, the staff that Aaron throws down, his snake eats the other snakes. Uh, and that shows uh, the, you know, the supremacy of, of 
Aaron's power over the the Khartoum and Mitzrayim. Um, so it's my understanding, at least from the, the text that we have uh, in the Hebrew Bible, that they definitely believed in magic. They definitely believed that there were supernatural forces that were not the exclusive purview of their god, Yahweh, um, uh, and that these uh, that these practices are right. The, again, the most famous example is the Baalat, uh, the Baalat Ov at Endor, the sometimes translated as the Witch of Endor, uh, there and and where she summons the ghost of Samuel. Although it's not clear at all what's going on in that story, it's a very unusual story linguistically as well. Um, and part of what's going on there is that there's not much in the way of angels and demons in the Hebrew Bible. There are some angels there, very few and very little in the way of demons. But of course, angels and demons become a much bigger deal in Judaism uh, in the Babylonian exile when they come in contact with Zoroastrianism. And it's in Zoroastrianism that you have a huge array of angels and demons. And those are ultimately incorporated into Judaism after the exile in 586 BCE. And of course, by the time that Christianity comes along, angels and demons are enormously popular. In fact, many of the early names for demonic entities, perhaps the most famous a uh, demonic entity in early Judaism is a demon called Asmodeus. Uh, and that word is actually not even Hebrew, it's Persian, which shows you that the, these early demons being imported into Judaism and then eventually, of course, of course, occurring in Christianity are not coming from an Israelite context, they're coming from a Persian context, which is a case where um, uh, Jewish contact in the exile with uh, Zoroastrians, Persians, is uh, influencing their religious beliefs. Uh, and the same thing, of course, of course, of course occurs in uh, Christianity, where we have Christian magic that's very similar to the kind of Greco-Egyptian magic practiced in Egypt at the turn of the Common Era, um, etc. So um, again, it's one of these really important things to understand that uh, religions are not impervious. They are, into their religions are cultural structures that uh, that uh, are always being influenced by other forces from the outside. And so Christianity, Judaism, Islam uh, are always being influenced. And so it's unsurprising, for instance, that, uh, that uh, you're gonna get all kinds of influences from the outside. In fact, I think one of my favorite examples of this was I was at a church in a uh, really early church in uh, Scandinavia in, uh, in Sweden. And that church had a, uh, uh, and on the altar of very, of this early altar is very, very early, very early medieval. And it depicted um, a guy, a bearded guy with a hammer, another bearded guy with holes in his hands and feet fighting a, uh, fighting a uh, snake. And you recognize the second guy is Jesus. Clearly Jesus is gonna be on the altar of a Christian church. But the other guy is Thor, right? And the snake is the world snake that we know Thor fights at Ragnarok. So we have this weird situation where early Christianity as it's being introduced in, into, into uh, Scandinavia is combining elements of Christianity and the indigenous uh, pagan religion. And you see this all through the development of Christianity as well. In fact, our, the names of the days of the week still are pagan deities. Thursday is Thor's day, Tuesday is Tuesday, uh, Wednesday is Odin's day. So it's unsurprising that these, these pagan elements survive. And that's the same is true in Judaism as well, that these um, non-Jewish elements are going to greatly influence Judaism. And one of the places that's going to appear, for instance, is going to be things like afterlife, heaven and hell are ideas that are greatly developed in Zoroastrianism, but you do not see them, in, for instance, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, now, the you, I have a question, though, because in Isaiah, and that, that's part of the Old Testament, and that's part of the text that in Judaism is mm -hmm. believed in, correct? Mm -hmm. um, it talks about Lucifer falling from heaven and it says, you know, he's cut down to the ground and I will ascend into heaven, exalt the throne, so on and so forth. Right. So in Judaism, how, how do they define Lucifer and where, I mean, if he's fallen from heaven, where do they think that Lucifer went? Yeah. So that section in Isaiah, it's from Isaiah seven fourteen, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. um, it's a fourteen twelve. 1412, yeah. Uh, that section of Isaiah is a long uh, criticism of Nebuchadnezzar. So um, when you look at that, we look at that prophecy in more detail, uh, what Isaiah is talking about is basically a criticism of, of a Babylonian king. And so in Judaism, they don't read that, we don't read that as a, as a story about the origins of Satan falling from heaven. 
we read it as a uh, as an a, as a criticism of Nebuchadnezzar claiming that he's going to do all these things, and rather he's okay. destroyed. Uh, and the word Lucifer right just means light bearer. Uh, it just okay. means dawn, actually, in Hebrew. Um, and so this right, word also Lucifer, calls it. Uh, let's see, something of the morning. Yeah, the sun of the morning. Sun of the morning. Right? Yeah. Uh, the dawn, yeah, it's just a poetic way of talking about the the dawn, uh, and then again, you get these a uh, lot of these ideas that develop uh, from Christianity, where Christianity, of course, is absorbing a lot of the Hebrew Bible, but going back into the Hebrew Bible and mining it to justify Christian ideas. Uh, certain people, and, right? <laughs> again, I said certain people because there's so many different. I mean, you talk to one Christian, another Christian, and you can really have vastly different, you know, takeaways from it, depending on which sect they fall into and all of that. Sure, very, sure. Very but they, I, think, I think all of Christianity, with the exception of Marcionism, right? Marcionism was, I think, one of the only versions of Christianity to completely reject the Hebrew Bible. Uh, but most versions of Christianity, I think with the exception of a Marcionite Christianity, which didn't survive, um, uses the Hebrew Bible as a way of justifying uh, text, uh, justifying uh, theological ideas to be found in, in Christianity. Um, yeah, Non-denominational, uh, Old Testament, New Testament are viewed as a complete text, and right. New Testament is obviously after Jesus was born and changed everything, and that everything in the Old Testament was basically, as far as sacrifices, replaced by the sacrifice of God giving his only son. Right. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say it justifies. I mean, I guess it depends on who you ask, but it justifies in the in the literary sense. That is to say that uh, that the that the because um, I think just just the word justify it to certain people it would expand it, right. um, but then certain people could argue that it's a justification, right? Depending on which way you view or the, it. Or the Hebrew Bible predicts the the coming uh, the coming of Jesus and basically predicts mm -hmm. the theology of Jesus. Uh, the theology of Christianity, whereas, for instance, in Judaism, uh, the Hebrew Bible is, of course, very important, but one scripture among a uh, dozen scriptures that have developed. So in Judaism, we don't have a closed canon. That is to say, um, the canon has continued to develop. We have the Hebrew Bible, then we have the Mishnah and the Baraisa and the Talmud and the Zohar. And so there's a much more expansive sense of what counts as authoritative in Judaism. Well, if you take, so in Judaism, um you know, similar to the New Testament, the way it's broken up in books, isn't it kind of similar with Judaism where, you know, they've expanded, but they've just rejected the New Testament because they don't believe that Jesus was the son of God. And there's different texts and different books, similar to the way that the New Testament has different books and variations of things. Um, yeah, it's certainly the case that Judaism doesn't accept the messianic claims of right. Jesus. Um, but the the literature that re that emerges in the rabbinical period is enormous, of course. Uh, the Talmud, of course, runs into 70 volumes. It's a massive uh, text. Do you know when you say 70 volumes, how many pages are we talking? It depends on the edition that you're looking at. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the typical... Right, because small text versus large, but yeah, on yeah, average... Hundreds how would, how yeah, hundreds pages? thousands of pages. I, I, I would have to look up and see exactly how many pages it runs into. But the, the, the of course, the Mishnah emerges as an early text in Judaism, and the commentary on the Mishnah is the Talmud, and there are two Talmuds. Uh, that aren't quite the same, and then there are many commentaries on that literature, and then you have the mystical literature, which is its own um, its own branch of literature, which is also quite enormous. So um, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, do I have a copy? Like this is a, acad a modern academic edition of the Mishnah. Okay. Right. So this is uh, the Jacob Neusner translation. This is an academic version, not a religious version. And that would be just not including the old testament but actually yeah, this, would be, this would be a this, this would be one text of, of of judaism and then there's an enormous commentary on this text that runs into dozens of volumes right uh, dozens and, and dozens are of there volumes. are there any texts that are i think you touch on this a bit but accepted um by the faith and then some texts that are rejected by depending on what part of the faith you know or, or sect you fall into i think that um there are some texts that are not considered. A so you think of, it's better to think of authority, of authority on in terms of a spectrum. Some texts are very strongly authoritative and some texts are not authoritative. Um, um, 
and some texts are considered heretical. And uh, what's weird about Judaism is that the heretical texts are preserved. We don't burn them. We preserve them and they're sort of put in a safari where you know that they're dangerous, but there are people still study them. Um, and some texts that were declared heretical or picked up later is perfectly fine. It's, they, it's funny that they, they get fixed. I don't know. Um, but typically the, the literature in Judaism uh, that is considered authoritative is, is vast. Uh, and um, it's a pretty standard set of, of literature. Um, and that standard set, and again, it, it looks, and again, as an attorney, you would appreciate it. It looks a lot like, a lot of it looks like case law. A lot of it is, uh, if you have an oven and half the oven has been cut into, is separated into two distinct parts and you cook meat in one side, can you cook milk in the other? And, right, and so the question is like, and there are debates, the rabbis debate this. And then they go, of course, like every conversation, they go off in the details and they go off into tangents. And some of the tangents are, you know, what happens when you die? And that's when you get the speculation around things that are much more uh, mystical or metaphysical, spiritual, perhaps. Um, right. I think that happens in Christianity quite often as well. <laughs> sure, it does in every religion. Many religions. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I, th I think it's the book of Revelations that says thou shall not add to this book. And then many Christians interpret that as you shouldn't accept any information from any other literature. Outside well, of, like, the then King you King have King. the Mormon faith that, you know, they, the Book of Mormon. And, you know, I, I love to, I love to challenge, you know, I always apologize when I'm going, don't, don't mind me, I'm just telling me. But, but we, uh, you know, we had some uh, Mormons come to our door and they said, you know, yes, this is the way I said, but if you believe in Revelation, it doesn't say thou shall not add any of the books. And he said, well, it's not really a book. I said, but it's called the Book of Mormon. <laughs> you yeah. just well, know. Early, early Christianity had many, there, there are dozens of books that existed in early Christianity. Right. That, that, that were not included. That were not included for, exactly. for a host of reasons. Uh -huh. um, and of course, there's also books quoted in the Hebrew Bible and quote, books quoted in the New Testament that have not survived. Right. So uh, the, the, the literature of these cultures was, was vast. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, what counts as authoritative and what doesn't uh, is, again, tells you more about the people making those decisions than it does about the texts that get that get chosen. Okay. Um, um, so there are yeah. many you know, great many texts that have been recovered, for instance, in Egypt uh, that were part of a Christianity that is basically gone extinct. Mm -hmm. But we know, for instance, Valentinianism, which was a form of Christianity that we would call Gnosticism now, was incredibly popular. Uh, Valentinus himself was one of the most authoritative uh, members of the Christian church in Rome. Uh, and eventually he lost. I mean, he, he lost the power struggles that were going on in early Christianity. And uh, his, his literature was eventually suppressed and his version of Christianity was, was basically, uh, basically went extinct. So. Was that, so, the, what, what was the, was the Coptic Christians, was that a separate, did they have their own canon that included Coptic different books? So Coptic Christianity, uh, Coptic Christianity is just the uh, orthodoxy, Christian orthodoxy in Egypt. Uh, they have the same canon as all Christians, and I think that they're accepted within the communion of the Catholic Church more generally. Uh, in fact, they, uh, I think the Copts have, uh, they control a section of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Excuse me, you may be thinking of the Gnostics, um, okay. um, which is a bit of a catch-all term for... Uh, various type of Christians and non-Christians that existed in the, in the uh, late classical world, but with the exception of one uh, type of Gnosticism, a religion called Mandeanism, um, Gnosticism basically went extinct. Um, it survived in some ways here and there. There were some Gnostics that seemed to perhaps have survived in um, Slavic lands as the Bogomils, and then perhaps into Europe as the Cathars, although we now think the Cathars were never a religious group. They were probably a tiny minority. Um, uh, but the only section, the only sect to survive to this day is the Mandeans who are unfortunately very endangered because of the social unrest and the, the, uh, the horrifying situation in the Middle East. Uh, those folks are largely, uh, in, endangered also because of their marrying practices, which prevents people from marrying into the religion and converting into it. It makes their numbers, uh, basically very small and they're on the threat, uh, on the threat of becoming extinct, unfortunately. Uh, now, earlier. Oh, go ahead. Oh. You go ahead. No, it just seems that sometimes uh, politics can even, you know, play an effect on different faiths because uh, in traditional, you know, Christianity, at first, there was not even a book that was translated um, to where common people could read it. And that was forbidden. 
and I think it was King Henry, I can't remember, King Henry the 12th, I'm butchering this, it's King Henry something, but he was the one that uh, married Anne Boleyn and beheaded quite a few women. Henry the and that was, that was one of the whole scandals is that they were introducing, you know, the, um, the Bible that was translated so that people could read it and they broke away from the Catholic church. And so it's just, the history is quite interesting. On sure. how they, they yeah. Obviously the people that have the ability to interpret authoritatively interpret these, these texts have enormous power over people. Mm -hmm. And um, I've never seen a, a situation really in history where power is transferred uh, tr power is transferred in a way that the powerful lose it. Um, and so it's unsurprising that it has to be basically wrested from, I mean, Tyndale, of course, was one of the early translators of the Bible into English, and he was, of course, killed. So, Right. And it's so dangerous because it can start out in the hands of someone who means to do good, and that same power gets transferred onto someone who can do, you know, very much bad with it. So you see that throughout history, I think. Yeah. Earlier, we're talking about, like, it's interesting, like, with Baal, versus Yahweh. It's like the actions of Jesus that he does in the name of Yahweh that have miraculous results. And then the actions of Baal worshipers that do in the name of Baal that have miraculous results. And then it's like, you have the people on the outside seeing this, not understanding it. They call it magic. One becomes sanctioned and the other becomes forbidden. That's kind of how it seems to me from what, just me looking at it. And it's also interesting. I want to get your thoughts on this because Ashley had mentioned it saying things like psychics that was forbidden but then in the old testament we have the prophets and then you know there's I guess between psychics and prophets the dynamics between that they seem very similar so that's interesting I, I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on what you thought about that